to, to invite Howard up to the stage to, to talk to us about uh, plant science on the precipice. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation today. Um, I'm really happy to be here. It's, uh, I love PAG and uh, it's a chance to not only talk about science, but it's a chance to see people who I haven't seen in a long time. So it's always uh, exciting. And LGC, as you'll see, is a, a key partner in a project that we have going on currently. And uh, my goal is just to really say that when we start to think about the scale of problems that we have, I think the word one billion is really important, or two billion, or three billion, or four billion people that we should be able to impact by the work we're doing. And it seems like a, a, a huge conversation or, or a huge ask of the world of science to have that kind of impact. But really, we have the opportunity right now to have that happen. Maybe this is it. So one of the first things we have to consider is socialization, which is this sort of notion, which is how we learn to behave in society as scientists. And it's, it's something most people don't really want to talk about. You work in your lab, you make a discovery, it's translated, it goes to scale. But in fact, it's really important. It turns out there's currently 7.4 billion food and medical experts in the world. So add to PAG, every person walks around has an opinion about food and medicine. Uh, much of it is based on fi uh, uh, fiction, uh, and it doesn't really hold true, but it doesn't matter because people have their opinion. And today, social media trumps science in almost every category. If you think of something you've thought about, then go on social media and look at what's happened to that conversation and how it's morphed into something really preposterous, then you have a pretty good idea about the nature of what's happening. Traceability and transparency. Everyone I know wants to know where their stuff comes from. Where does your food come from? How does that technology impact what I do, whether it's LGC or Oxford Nanopore or anyone? How does it really impact me? And then there's a huge amount of distrust of us. Uh, I live in a community that's uh, rather well-educated called Davis, California. But if you go 10 miles away, there are communities where pretty much everything we say would be doubted. Whether it's on fact or fiction, it doesn't really matter. It just doesn't have the continuity that we need to have. So we talk about the Green Revolution. It saved a billion people. That was the impact of the Green Revolution. Swaminathan and Borlaug solved a problem that saved a billion people from starvation. And it was very simple, it was a very simple ask. The wheat was falling over or lodging because it grew too tall. Could Borlaug and Swaminathan develop a wheat that wouldn't fall over in the wind and the rain? Because all these people were at risk of starvation because the crop was failing. And the outcome, which m many of, the, of you in this room know, was they did. They developed dwarf wheat. Norman was at Simit and MS Swaminathan at that time was operating out of a research institute in India. But the fact is, all those people were going to starve if there wasn't a scientific solution. And it didn't take 20 or 30 years. It was done very quickly. And it was uh, translated very quickly. And it went to scale very quickly. And I, I love the phrase that almost certainly, however, the first essential component of social justice is adequate food for all mankind. And I remember hearing Borlaug say that, in fact. And when you think about that, those of us who are in agriculture, that should be part of our mantra, if you will. IR64. I, I share an office with Alan Van Dyne, who's here uh, at a place called Plant Reproductive Biology at UC Davis. And in that building, Gerd of Cush lived for many, many years after he left Erie and came back to the United States. And IR64 is a rice that's eaten by more people in the world than any other rice. And it's been a, a part of the world of rice for many, many years. And when you think about what Gerd have said about what he did, it really is quite profound that Human hunger and desires are elastic, but land is not elastic. So he was sent to the stage for what had to happen. And when you think about 
what IR64 looked like. This is what it took to get IR64 out of the thinking process and into the scaling up process. These were all the crosses that had to be made to get that done. And it's really quite profound when you think about it. Many of you have not been, or many of you are tr uh, uh, traditional plant breeders, and this is what it takes to get a new crop to the table. This is Gerd of Cush's work. And he won the World Food Prize for it, amongst many other prizes. Sequencing, assembly, and annotation. How many of you remember the Sanger sequencer? A few of you. I think everybody's saying it because they want to get their hands up in the air. How many of you worked on a Sanger sequencer? Oh, that's pretty good. How many of you know how many Nobel Prizes that Frederick Sanger won? He won two Nobel Prizes, one of the few people to ever win two Nobel Prizes. But think about what he said. And indeed, this theme has been the center of all my research since 1943 both because of its intrinsic fascination and my conviction that a knowledge of sequences could contribute much to our understanding of living matter. That was his driving force. And then you see the HiSeq 4000 and the BGI Seq 500. That wasn't enough. Then you had Oxford Nanopore came along and changed sort of our concept of how we were thinking about sequencing. And if that wasn't enough, and then came the um, MGI T7, which can do 60 human genomes a day, which is more than 20,000 human genomes a year. 20,000 human genomes a year. And when we were doing the Human Genome Project, how many years did it take to do one genome? 10 years. About 10 years. So now you can do 60 a day, 20,000 a year. So the real problem is going to be, how do you deal with all that data, of course? But sequencers have not stood still. Gerd of Kush did not stand still. Borlaug and Swaminathan did not stand still. Every one of those had impacts over a, a billion people by what they did. And these are some eccentric numbers that most of you uh, probably never seen put together quite this way. 37, 48, and 7. 37% of all the children of age five in rural Africa are stunted. 48% of all the rural children in India under age five are stunted. And 70% of the children in the United States are stunted. So stunting has a number of characteristics. The first is you're, fall, you're small for your physical size. Second, your neural tubes do not develop completely. And third, economically you will never be successful compared to peers who fully are developed. And fourth, and maybe worse possible thing, is an individual is more likely to suffer very serious infectious diseases and die young. So this is a real problem. It's caused by chronic hunger and malnutrition when a mother is pre-pregnant, during pregnancy, and it's irreversible. So I got together with a few people and this gives you an idea where it's really uh, terribly impactful. It's not just Africa, it's a subcontinent. And the United States is 7%. And parts of Europe don't, do not report uh, because they don't measure it for whatever reason that is. And in 2018, Nature uh, did a very extensive paper about it. Um, it just, it's so tragic. And if you ask a normal audience, uh, what do you think about stunting? They say, well, people are small for their size and age and et cetera, et cetera. But they never talk about the fact that it's chronic hunger and malnutrition. So we can ship all the wheat and corn we want to from the United States <laughs> to these countries. And guess what? It's not going to help them because nutritionally, it is deficient completely in macro and micronutrients, vitamins. So a few years back, uh, we formed something called the African Orphan Crops Consortium and the African Plant Breeding Academy, which is led, taught, and organized by the University of California Davis Seed Biotech Center. Alan Van Dyne's my colleague here, uh, was a leading force in that having happened. Our goal was to improve the, the nutrition of the rural sector of Africa. 
That's about a billion people now, depending upon how you count. Again, I, I, I like the idea that science that we do can impact that many people. And this is a list of the first uh, group of crops. A couple have changed. It's hard to read, but we chose 100 food crops from Africa, food scientists, people of that nature, anthropologists, women's groups, uh, plant breeders all got together and chose these crops. And then the African Union added the baobab tree when we got our approval to make it 101 food crops. And this is how it's possible to get this done. Because if you as an institution decide you are going to do something, it's very unlikely you would be able to accomplish this given the scale. But when you add this uncommon collaboration together, it's very possible to get this done. And they're odd bedfellows, if you will, in this particular project. BGI it does a lot of the heavy lifting on the reference genomes. The World Agroforestry Center hosts the African Plant Breeding Academy. NEPAD, which is the development arm of the African Union, actually uh, gives us the endorsement to be able to do this in Africa. Mars Incorporated, where I come from, and University of California, Davis, which is an integral partner. Every one of these people have played an, an integral role. We started our lab there in Nairobi with Thermo Fisher kit, then we moved to Illumina kit, and we hopefully will add a few more things in the very near future. Let me, let's go back. When we have all this work, if you don't have people trained to use it, it doesn't really mean anything. You'll just have data. So under the leadership of the University of California, Davis, the African Plant Breeding Academy is training 35, 36 people a year in a very specialized class, two, uh, three two-week sessions over a year where some of the best plant breeders in the world come together to teach these uh, cohorts, and it, I invite you on Wednesday, there's a presentation by five of those individuals who are here at PAG to tell their story about what it has meant to them to go through the academy and the kind of work they're doing. They've also raised an a enormous amount of money through the European Union and other places, well over 20 million dollars for research or 20 million euros for research, and they've started 191 breeding programs. Simultaneously, there's this issue called aflatoxin, or mycotoxins, or ochratoxins, however you want to refer to it. And because in 100 years, no one has figured out how to detoxify aflatoxin in storage, a few of us got together and said, what would it mean if you could detoxify aflatoxin in storage? Get clean grain out of a field, but if it's toxified in storage because storage is not the way we think about the Midwest of the United States. It's really much poorer than that. How would you do it? What, what would it take for that to happen? Talk to lots of people, everybody threw their hands up. So there's an interesting puzzle called Fold It Online. Started out of the University in Washington, Seattle by the Baker Lab there. And what you'll see is it's a game that can be played. And people not like you and me, truck drivers, uh, stay-at-home moms, stay-at-home dads, uh, retired people play this game. It's a game. But we're folding proteins. Aflatoxin is a class one carcinogen. Uh, it, it's in almost everything. We're working simultaneously on plants using CRISPR technology to be able to make the plants resilient against it. But till then, we have to work on storage. But 4.5 billion people a year are exposed to aflatoxin. Most of you probably don't see it, but many of you eat it in peanuts or maize or other crops. And in a bad year in the United States, which has very high standards, it's almost a billion and a half dollar in losses for the maize industry. So on World Food Day 2017, we launched the aflatoxin uh, puzzle with the FAO. The idea was to degrade aflatoxin. Seems like such a simple thing. Why hasn't someone tried to figure out how to degrade aflatoxin in storage? And I don't have the answer to that, to be honest with you. I've tried to find it many times. And this is what we do. 
uh, want to neutralize aflatoxin. And if I can make this work, it'll give you just a, a short video. You can see we just fold proteins. This is what's going on. You go online, get a little tutorial, and you start folding proteins. Then you get a score. Then we analyze what those new proteins look like. We send all the information to a lab in Germany from Thermo Fisher. They analyze it with UC Davis. It comes back. And at UC Davis, we run these new enzymes against aflatoxin in a lab. And two nights ago, we had the first hit of 100 that we're trying that we think will detoxify aflatoxin. In four uh, particular uh, test runs, we were able to detoxify aflatoxin. All this information is public domain. All the information for the African orphan crops is public domain. Because who wants to really own the cure for stunting or the cure for aflatoxin? So we've received over a million and a half puzzles. A hundred have shown the potential. This is, again, a funny collaboration of people who normally don't work together, which means whatever you think about who you collaborate with, now's the time to drop all that. And then I'd like to show you a little project that uh, we published on August the uh, 7th, uh, 2018. Uh, if you ever thought about something going from impossible to reality. Think about Teosinte as the, as the ancestor of modern maize. This is a photo from John Dobley at the University of Wisconsin, who has worked extensively in this area. It's, it's incalculably complicated to think that Teosinte is modern maize. That through selection, and then later on breeding, classic Mendelian breeding, we ended up with this perfect thing called corn that we have in the fields of Iowa and in your backyards when you have a household garden. And it grows everywhere in the world. This is staggering. This was just human innovation in the Oaxaca Valley of Mexico. So 38 years ago, I, I saw some maize that grew without fertilizer. But there really wasn't any way to determine why or how. There was no techniques. There was no microbiome 38 years ago. Some of you aren't 38 years old, but believe me, 38 years ago, we didn't have any of these tools. So we had a hypothesis. Again, Alan is one of my colleagues in this project, with a number of other people at UC Davis and at University of Wisconsin, that there was a way for coevolution to deliver a nitrogen fixation in maize without putting fertilizer on the field. The paper is pretty interesting. I won't go into great detail. Alan's going to talk about it later this week. But in this mucilaginous material off of the aerial roots, in an oxygen-starved environment, is this amazing uh, microbiome of nitrogen-fixing microbes. And they auto-dose themselves, ammonia. So that it drips onto the plant from these roots. And when a certain growth has taken place, it stops producing nitrogen that way. And the plant grows and finishes its growth. So corn variety gets nitrogen atmospherically, reducing the need for uh, fertilizer. It was one of the holy grails. I remember going to school in the early 60s, and they said, boy, nitrogen fixing maize. If you could ever figure out nitrogen fixing maize, because the cost economically is tens of billions of dollars. The cost environmentally is even more. And the people who need it the most simply can't get it. They don't get nitrogen in many parts of the world because it's too expensive or there's no system. So we published this paper. And we proved it four different ways, which is always interesting how reviewers of papers say, I don't like that technique. So try that technique. So we, we tried that technique. And then they would say to you, no, we don't like that technique. Try this technique. So every technique was suggested to it to prove nitrogen fixation. We tested. And the result is uh, it fixes nitrogen. 
it's not a modern corn like you and I would talk about. It. It's a tropical corn. So it has to be bred. Now starts the hard work. Discovery is always fun and easy. And unique to this project as well was that the community will share and have access to the benefits from this being commercialized. It's the uh, very first internationally recognized certificate of compliance written by Mexico. It's the first one ever written for the United States as a participant. So this is all under the Nagoya Protocol. It's part of Mexican law. And this project lives by that entire principle with the community. So plant science is on the precipice. The speed of change is faster than our response. And these are the things you see if you travel the world. You see big cities. You see shanty towns. You see these fields in Brazil that are being harvested by 20 or more combines simultaneously. It could be uh, the Great Plains State. It could be anywhere. And you see maize with aflatox on it. You see erosion. You see airplanes like we see around Davis. Uh, spraying uh, fertile, uh, fer herbicides and fungicides on the fields. So what we're faced with is the speed of change is quicker than our response. To, c to have a problem and solve it is no, is no longer acceptable to take 10 or 20 years. So all the tools you see in these exhibit halls, all the papers that you see, all the <coughs> posters you'll hear, have to shorten that distance because without that, we're really on the precipice. Because if you go to Africa and understand stunting, you go to India and you understand stunting, or if you look at aflatoxin, 4.5 billion people eat aflatoxin on a regular basis in their lives, then we're not, we're not doing something right if we don't try to solve some of these problems. Thank you. Uh, well, no, I think we, hopefully, I mean, certainly for myself, that was an amazing and stimulating talk. And uh, I'd like to open it out to the floor for, for questions, and, which I'm sure there'll be many of. Or not. <laughs> sure. Uh, do, you have, do you have a plan to um, sequence uh, that uh, gelatinous substance you showed on the court? Uh, it, it's been done, oh, yes. It's been done? Yes. By, I think, Jean Michel Anet. It's probably gone as far on the sequencing of the mucigel and Alan Bennett, Bart Weimer. Yes. We, we know more than I can talk about. And it's uh, in discussion for commercialization now. But that is a seven to 10 year project and 20 or $30 million. But when it happens, then you have the ability to reduce your nitrogen application 35, 65% which would be significant. And the people who don't have nitrogen, it would double or triple their yields immediately. Thanks, Albert. It was very nice. But for the aflatoxin, you know that uh, we have something for aflatoxin uh, that I think has developed. And we are in the blind in, in, in all over Africa. We have uh, Yes, there's a paper coming out by John Pitt. Um, it's a very complicated paper. I won't go into more except to say there's a real question how functional this product that IITA has developed with Gates is. And um, I saw John Pitt in Australia recently, and he was actually. Uh, despondent as he ran the statistics that it did not perform as well as promised. So this, this is, biocontrol is, is a wonderful thing if it works. But if it, if it rains, it doesn't work. And it rains almost everywhere in the world periodically or systematically or out of order in the past that we would think about. So I'm very concerned about that. Uh, we're working on maize with Jennifer Doudna, peanuts with uh, Richard Mishamore, uh, to see if we can't use CRISPR or, or Higgs to do the same thing. So you, I just worry that after 10 years uh, or 15 years of us trying this with John Pitt, 
in Thailand and other places, we did not have any success. So I'm fearful that after all that money has been spent, we may not have a success with the product from IITA. I hope I'm wrong. I hope John Pitt is wrong, but I don't think so. What about the efforts to transfer this trade into the mainstream uh, maize lines? That's what will happen next. But our group is not maize breeders. So we made the discovery, and there's only a limited number of companies that have the horsepower to do this. I'm sure you could name four or five, and they would be the four or five I would name. So there's conversations uh, to get those companies to do that specifically. Yes, please. Uh, uh, you mentioned that Green Revolution saved lives. That's for sure. But it also brought uh, negative impacts uh, to the nature. So could you comment on that? Sure. Uh, I was a close friend of Norman, so if, if it sounds like I'm prejudiced, Take that at face value, I admitted beforehand, and Swaminathan. Imagine you make a discovery as a doctor in 1960 or 1967, pick a year when they had finished it, and no one improves on that for 40 or 50 years. That's the problem. The problem is not the Green Revolution, the problem is that it wasn't taken to the next step because science, we, you, whoever, became complacent because it worked. Borlaug, before he died, uh, he was in Norway, I was with him, and a, a young person asked a question and really was railing against him, and Norman could be short and curt, and those of you who knew him, but he basically said, what have you done to take what I did and make it better? Because if you're a doctor in 1967 doing heart surgery, and you want to have heart surgery in 2018, you don't want to have it done the way it was done in 1967. And that's the problem. We didn't improve the system. So I, I agree with you. The Green Revolution had some problems. But the bigger problem was the scientific community did not improve that when they should have because they became complacent. And the one thing we can't do is be complacent about anything because resilience is the ability to respond quickly to a problem. So they did that, but they never thought that that solution would last 30, 40, 50 years. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Back here, please, if you speak loudly. I, I'm, sure, I'm semi-deaf. Uh, to what extent are you concerned about the political climate around GMOs and things of that nature? And, uh, and how are you open to co-culturing microbial uh, solutions and things of that nature? Yeah, you're asking the wrong person. I mean, I live on GMO medicines. Um, I should have died in my 30s, but uh, cardiovascular medicine was making giant leaps using genetic engineering for medicine. The only reason I'm alive is because of genetic engineering. So you ask me, I think it's a great thing. <laughs> I, you know, it's... It was easy to deify or demonize, not deify, demonize the science at first when it came out. Was it badly executed by those companies? Possibly so. You know, it's hard for me to judge those companies personally. But the technologies were largely held by a small group. Take CRISPR, it's totally democratized. In the state of California, there's a, and we, I was talking to Alan the other day, there's at least 750 labs in the state working on CRISPR. It's democratized. Genetic engineering to me seems like the same thing as the Green Revolution. It's almost past tense. So I, I feel differently about CRISPR. I think that the uh, European Union made a very bad mistake in their judgment. I think they will change it. There's already movement afoot. I was at Max Planck not long ago. They had 15 labs working on CRISPR in Germany. It's being used all over England and France and maybe not Italy, but Europe is using it, the Netherlands. So it's, it's going to work. And the debate is much less complicated or divisive in plants than it is in some other categories that you might think about of using these technologies right now. So I love the technology. 
And yet, you know, actually, I, anybody diabetic in here? All diabetic medicine in the world is genetically engineered. So where, where do we draw the line? How do we make a, a decision? How are you going to get rid of uh, black sugar toga? How are you going to get rid of aflatoxin? I don't think you can do it with traditional breeding. Otherwise, we would have traditionally bred resistant maize, peanuts, cassava, spices. I can go on forever. Cacao, which is a big issue for my company because of okra toxin. So I can't, rule, I can't take anything off the table. OK. One last question. Um, you have to speak loudly. Yes. So Alan's smiling. I mean, it's, it's just it's 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 willpower. You know, you just go to the people and say, you know, why wouldn't you collaborate with us? You have something that is valuable. You should be part of this. I mean, I mean that slide is really a peculiar slide on the African orphan crops because it's people who had never really worked together. We have FAO. We have Thermo Fisher in the early days. We have aluminum. We have BGI. Some of them compete in the same territory. But when we have the meetings, everybody has one vote. So there's some people here who want to join us. Because it's an effort that is solving a problem and taking it to scale. And people want to be part of that. And they don't pay to join. There's no, there's no fee to join. And then we have partners, which is another list 18 or 20 groups long that are working on specific crops and we just bring them in. Um, I think it's the purity of the activity. And all of this activity is in the public domain because I like giving away science. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to own it. We make chocolate bars and pet food. We don't really need to own patents in these areas. So that's my answer. I know it's not very sufficient, but it's, you know, it's, I don't know that I'm a very um, engaging personality necessarily to go to someone and say, hey, why don't you join? That's not my specialty. It's the work that we're doing to try and solve a problem. But I, I should be done. Well, th thank you very much, Howard. I think it's a, a wonderful talk. And um, as, as one of the partners said yes, then I, I think you are very engaging in that respect. Thank you.